Ah, <laughs> oh, man. We're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Brothers, sisters, siblings, welcome to Penn Sunday School starring Penn Gillette. My name is Michael Ludo. Matt, Freddie, Rich, Penn, and I are broadcasting from our separate homes in Las Vegas. And today, we got a whole bunch of little things to talk about. Some viewer mail and that sort of thing. But really, we got nothing. Nothing, I tell you, nothing. <laughs> Here he is preaching love, Mr. Penn Gillette. Hello, everybody. I'm a moose. Um, not really a moose. I'm here to preach love. I didn't want people to think, to believe that yeah. I was a moose. <laughs> How is everybody doing? We're doing Fantastic. really good. What could be better than this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is, uh, it is amazing. Uh, other people, you know, that are going out and working and so on have uh, all this danger and heroics to deal with. I have none of that. I have not been out of my house in five months. Uh, I have gone out in the car five times, but I haven't gotten out of the car while I'm out. So I haven't been any place but my house for five months. My feet have not touched ground that is not my house. Yeah. Uh, it's remarkable. Any desire to? Um, as time goes by, I have less and less desire for anything. You know, Glenn was telling me the other day that, uh, well, for a long time, how much he misses the travel and the shows and the glamorous life we lead. Yeah. I don't think I do. Really? Yeah. You posted about missing your theater the other day. I do. I do have moments of missing doing the show. Yeah. But I'm afraid those are going away. There might have been all this neurosis that compelled me to do shows that may be fading away. Well, the first part, no one doubted, not even yourself. Right. That there was a neurosis about you having to perform all the time. Mm -hmm. you, hated for, you hated vacation time or unplanned time. I did. You still keep your time relatively planned now, though, yeah? My time is stupidly planned for someone who has no plans. <laughs> I have blocks of time when I do everything. I yeah. do 27 minutes and 27 seconds, and I do juggling practice, magic practice, bass practice, writing, and um, I do my exercise, and I do my meditation, and all of that is laid out carefully. And uh, I do that. But uh, to do about four hours of work now takes me six, whereas to do four hours of work used to take me three. Okay. <laughs> so um, I do, uh, I've never been a procrastinator, now I am. Sometimes I sit going, I really want to practice the bass, but I'll sit here another few minutes. Yeah, yeah. And I also think every once in a while at night when it gets to be about 7 o'clock and I flop down in the chair to watch like a situation comedy with my son. Yeah. Uh, I think, oh, I couldn't do a show now. <laughs> exhausted I, I do remember back in the day where i was doing the bucket show and uh sarah was doing jersey boys and i had to put my children to bed then she'd come home and then i would leave at at uh 9 9 30 to go do the 10 o'clock bucket show and um getting the whole house quiet getting the whole place situated and everything so thing that there's i by the time Sarah came home, I'm like, I did not want to go do a show at all. <laughs> like, I got the house quiet. I watched two children fall asleep. I am in the most, like, cerebral place. <laughs> then I was like, no. There's, like, 12 people that need me. And I, <laughs> I would get in the car, and I would go do the bucket show. Even if one person, <laughs> if one person just needs to sit there slightly distracted and give you one chuckle out of 45 minutes, that's <laughs> worth it. That's worth it. That's worth getting out of the car and leaving my children behind. <laughs> How much do you miss doing shows, Gudo? I can't tell anymore. I just can't tell. Sometimes I think about it and cry, and sometimes I think about it and go, oh, what do I care? I don't need to do a show. <laughs> just go sit here in my yard and watch TV or spin plates. Getting very good at plate spinning. Uh, I'm not getting very good, but I'm getting better. Good. 
I can't tell. I'm working on a bunch of new material for my noodler, and I can't tell whether I'm good doing a good thing by like waiting it out and knowing that live performance will return and that I will have new material for that moment, or whether I'm an idiot for not leaning into the Zoom thing and getting rid of all the stage material and just trying to figure out how to do magic for the virtual audience. Well, I think it's foolish to think that you won't be doing uh, live shows before 2023. Yeah. <laughs> I mean the end of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean for 40 people <laughs> in a stadium. <laughs> when, it's, when it's 20 feet apart is the new mandate. For live, for live entertainment. 100 feet apart. <laughs> Is this your card? Card, card, card. <laughs> I've worked a few state fairs where I had those crowds about that, about that dense. <laughs> I worked one where I had, I worked one where uh, it started raining and there was one lady and her kid in the audience and the stage was covered. So I brought them up on stage and did the show for them on the stage with me. <laughs> Just the two of them. We uh, had a job with Philadelphia 76. Yeah. Which, by the way, you can find video of me in a Philadelphia 76 promo juggling and eating an apple. Uh, you can find like four seconds of me from uh -oh. 76 with uh, curly circus arts hair and no glasses. Uh, and um, we were hired to do three shows a day. This was the Asparagus Valley Cultural Society. And they had set up uh, stages all around Philadelphia in very stupid places, like behind the art museum that you couldn't kind of get to. Yep. And we were paid, I believe, $75 a show, which was, you know, two twenty five dollars a day. That's great. Uh, which And it was seven days a week. And it was for a couple months. So we actually had money coming in. And there were four of us, you know, the three of us and Mark Garland doing tech. And um, <laughs> You had tech on your street show? <laughs> yeah, we did. I mean, it wasn't street shows. It was, you know, supposedly a stage show. All right. And the stages were not covered. And we were allowed to cancel any show we wanted because of inclement weather. Or no audience. But we could just make it with our expenses through the summer if we did every single one of these shows. So we were uh, hired to do a 45-minute show for $75. And um, there was one show in particular. There were a lot of shows that there were four people. We're not even talking about those. There was one show that was a downpour. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was nobody in the audience. Nobody. And there was nobody within sight. That is to say, <laughs> there was nobody involved in Philadelphia 76. <laughs> there were no windows facing the back of the art museum. Godot and I are already giggling with like such a pang of anxiety in our <laughs> stomachs. We know exactly what you're talking about right Done now. Done that show. <laughs> nobody. I mean, yeah. we were, uh, you know, the epistemological question. If Helen Keller falls in the forest and no one's there to hear her, <laughs> does she make a sound? <laughs> we were there. And um, we looked at each other and said, we need that money. We've got to do a show. So we did a show. Luckily, our contract said that a show was defined as whatever we wanted it to be. So uh -huh. we had a, um, uh, a marimba. That was rather weather resistant. And we had um, six mallets. <laughs> and the three of us stood behind um, the, uh, the uh, marimba. <laughs> and you know, uh, Spinal Tap has Jazz Odyssey. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had the um, um, less than sensitively named Oriental Fantasy. <laughs> which was us playing just the black keys. In the pouring room. I can almost hear it. That 
was it <laughs> for 45 minutes. And no one looked in, no one saw us. And we went and reported and they said um, all shows were canceled in Philadelphia, this, this you know noon show in the afternoon all over the city because no one could do shows because of the rain. And we said, we did. <laughs> and we did with our full, full intent, full honesty, able to, um, able to uh, check any sort of truth, any sort of questioning. Uh, we, we played the, so we were the only ones who that whole summer got paid for every single show. <laughs> Scorching heat, humidity, pouring rain, windstorms. The Asparagus Valley Cultural Society did their shows for no one. Yeah. And uh, it was, uh, you know, Philadelphia 76, or the, the bicentennial of the United States of America was uh, mm -hmm. a failure. <laughs> <laughs> you still created the most valuable Penn and Teller bootleg of all time. Yes. So that's the, that's the good news. <laughs> we also did shows for Philadelphia. We did a fashion show on the mall in front of the art museum. During a um, riot. Oh. There was a riot. There were people throwing things and signs and bottles and things being lit on fire and Molotov cocktails and cars. And we were hired to do a uh, break in a fashion show that was on the mall. <laughs> and we did that. We did our full show with nobody listening. <laughs> people screaming and yelling and hitting each other. And we did the show. <laughs> and that's where I did something that was, um, uh, I still, you know, you have this stuff that you cringe about. And Robbie and I thought that if everybody that saw it is dead and no one else remembers it, why do you still cringe? Oh, interesting. I cringe at things I said to my parents. My parents are both dead. And only my parents and I knew about it. And I still feel shame and embarrassment. And this is something that I've never told anyone, that I feel shame and embarrassment. I don't know if Teller even saw it. There was no one else there to see it. I was juggling knives on stage in Philadelphia. And there was a child with a balloon in the front row. <laughs> and... Uh, Somebody yelled out, not the child, but someone else yelled out, those knives aren't sharp. And I took my knife and went and popped the child's <laughs> balloon <laughs> to prove the knife was sharp. And the child then cried for the rest of the show. <laughs> now, as I tell that story, I am nauseated and my chest collapses yeah. and I feel miserable. You know, every night when I'm lying in bed before I go back to sleep, there are probably um, two dozen things that I revisit yeah. through my life that I'm sure no one else remembers and I still feel horrible about. <laughs> yeah. That's one of them. Now, I wonder if saying it out loud exercises it in any way. I don't know. Mm. I was doing a show in uh, Santa Cruz last year and uh, there was a kid heckling, a little tiny kid. And uh, then I asked for a volunteer in the show, and of course his hand shot up. And I said, you know, I was kind of hoping for somebody a little less mouthy. And uh, his mom came and dragged him out yelling at him <laughs> <laughs> because, of my, because of my comment, which I thought was a funny joke. But Yeah. Uh, I thought yeah. maybe you had a six-year-old heckling you, and you said, I don't bother you when you're working. I don't go out to the bus station <laughs> and knock the dick out of your mouth. <laughs> right, yeah. I've thought about that as well. <laughs> you know, there's all those standard heckler comebacks. Yep. When you're a variety artist, you can't use them. <laughs> They're all written for clubs. Although that one, that seems really good for a little kid on an amusement park, yeah. I don't, I think. I can't it, wait. I think you could do that. And I don't think anyone would hear it. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> it's They're like just so uh, used to it. It's like the Matt King thing, where everyone talks about how family friendly it is, and yeah. then he's everyone always says, "Why don't you do a late night show one night and just make it really filthy?" 
And Max says, my act is already really filthy. <laughs> and it is. And, he's, and he said it. And then I rewatched the show and I was like, it really is filthy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you can do it, but like with like, you know, like your clown horn or something. Do you have a clown horn? <laughs> but I don't go down to the... I don't, Who are you asking? <laughs> I don't go down to work where you can knock the out of your phone. On the, on the back of your head. Do you have a clown horn? <laughs> you know, kid, I don't go down to the bus station and knock the wah out of your wah when you're working. <laughs> I'm putting that in the show just as soon as we come back. <laughs> this is what I worked on. Amazon today. I'm going to order a horn. <laughs> now, Godot, I would have bet my life somewhere in your garage you have a horn. I do, but they haven't been used in a long time, and so the bulbs are <laughs> cracking. <laughs> That's, you know, part of the quarantine, I guess. My children... <laughs> Got into the um, Las Vegas Academy. Oh, they made it. All right. They had to do auditions, and they did a wonderful job. And now they have to choose their electives. So, by the way, Las Vegas Academy is not going to school. You're going to be doing it remotely. At home. So, um, they had to do these elaborate auditions. And Moxie had to do a mime audition, a monologue audition, and a song audition. And she's going into theater tech. And she's majoring in theater tech because she thinks if she wants to be a magician, she should know how theaters work. That's a great idea. That's great. And she said to me, "Um, uh, Daddy, how will I do theater tech remotely? And I said, (laughs) well, that'll be easy, Moxie. You'll sit in your room with the computer open. You'll stand by the light switch. And they'll go, Moxie. Q4, go. And you'll turn off the light switch. And they'll go, Moxie, Q17, go. And you'll turn on the light switch. And they'll go, Moxie, Q19, go. And you'll turn it off. And that's where you'll do theater tech that way. But they had to pick their electives. And they asked me for advice on what elective to pick. (laughs) And one of the electives was bell ringing. And I said, how can you possibly resist that? (laughs) But I do have a set of tuned bells in my garage. (laughs) Both of them were able to. Really? They were able to resist bell ringing. I was going to say, it sounds like the marshmallow test, except there there really is no marshmallow test, right? (laughs) The marshmallow test did not prove what people thought it did. So it did really happen? Yes, it did. Okay. But uh, the follow-ups were um, were iffy, and the uh, results—I mean, the um, conclusions—have been disputed hmm. by fat fucks who ate a lot of marshmallows. <laughs> That's who disputed. Done in by the fatties again. <laughs> For those of us who don't know, and I should bring up to speed, the marshmallow test is a famous test done for children four or five years old where they were given a marshmallow and left in a room. And uh, they were told, if we come back in 10 minutes or five minutes and you haven't eaten that marshmallow, you'll get more marshmallows. If you have eaten it, you won't get it. So it's a way to decide if they had the willpower. Now, some children amuse themselves doing something else. Some children looked out the window. My favorite children were the children like me who sat there and looked at the marshmallow for the entire amount of time. (laughs) Picked it up, sniffed it, but did not eat it. Those, to me, are the ones that, uh, if you want to grow up to be like me, that's what you want to do. (laughs) Uh, Now, the list of people who want to grow up to be like me is small. Yeah. Certainly does not include my children. I think that would be like a good test for people who might want to be elected officials. I think if you can do that, then it proves there's a little forethought there. Uh, Yeah. Although the same (laughs) pressures that make elected officials mean that you pay them five bucks and they slip you the whole bag early. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Day one, they watch the five minutes. Day two, they take the five bucks. <laughs> And then say, what marshmallows until their term runs out? Yeah. <laughs> There's that great joke about um, uh, three people who are locked in a room with three um, ball bearings. And they want to test the kind of person that does each job. And it is a uh, astrophysicist, a physicist, and a prop man. And I'm not going to use a gender non-determinate one because prop man is fine for this. <laughs> and they leave them in the room with the three ball bearings for an hour. And they come in to see how they've done. They go into the astrophysicist and he has made a working model of the universe with the three balls spinning around each other. Uh, they go to the second room and the physicist has made a working model of an atom with the three balls spinning around each other. And they go to the room with the prop man, and there's no balls there at all. And they say, what happened? He says, I lost one, I ate one, you only gave me two. (laughs) (laughs) It's a fine joke. Yes. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And I just heard someone mistell or tell in a way that I didn't like. A joke that Arthur Penn told me. Uh-oh. You know, the great director of Bonnie and Clyde, Little Big Man, uh, the miracle worker, fabulous director, told me a joke that I loved. And I told it to other people. And one of the people just told it in a movie as part of um, illustrating a point, And to my mind, told it wrong. Oh. Now, you know that the first time you hear a joke, especially from someone you love, You do not want to hear that joke again with any changes. Right. The way they told is the way it should be. Arthur Penn told me this joke, (laughs) and he told it to me, as I remember, which I think is probably not true, at the Russian Tea Room in uh, New York, which was a... Shishi. Yeah, very, very fancy place right around the corner from ICM Management Company uh, Agency. And uh, they serve borscht. So I think that's why I'm misremembering. But I was there with Arthur Penn. I just don't know if he told me the joke there. Uh, A writer, a director, and a producer go to the Russian tea room for borscht. They're each delivered their plate of borscht. The writer takes a sip of the borscht and says, this borscht is perfect. This is perfect borscht, just the way it is. This is perfect borscht. (laughs) The director takes a sip of the borscht says, this is very good borscht, very good borscht, but a little, little salt, little pepper, little sour cream, little movement around of the borscht. I can make this borscht fabulous. <laughs> the producer takes a sip of the borscht and goes, this borscht is really great. I think I'll piss in it. <laughs> now the way the person told it in this movie was the writer takes a sip of the borscht and says this is good borscht i can make it better with a little bit of salt and pepper yeah it seems very important that the writer wants nothing changed <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think regardless of the romantic notion that you want to hear it told the same way, you you just use sound logic to make sure that that's definitely the writer's MO. It has to be. I think it has to be the writer's MO. But the punchline is fabulous and told by Arthur Penn. Yeah. Great. That's great. It's even better. I got to tell you guys something. Uh, I have right over on my wall, and I have a iMac Pro, so I can't move it. I have an iMac Pro for absolutely no reason. (laughs) I can, um, I have enough computer power to um, edit Avatar (laughs) on the computer on my desk, and I use it for text. (laughs) And I'll tell you, it's fast enough for any text I want to type. I don't really feel much of a lag at all 
when I type a letter <laughs> in on my computer. <laughs> so I can't turn it. But over on my wall is one of the most beautiful things you will ever see. This episode is brought to you by Fracture. Fracture turns your digital images into beautiful glass prints. That's right. They print your photos directly on glass, transforming your memories into handcrafted, frameless prints. And the frameless part is really good because the edges are beveled and really nice. They don't cut you. Fracture helps you focus on the moments that matter most by turning your favorite memories into beautiful glass prints. And because I am so postmodern, my fracture is a picture of stained glass printed onto glass. <laughs> fracture prints directly into durable glass with soft edges for safe handling. Prints come in multiple sizes, no frames required, and each print comes with a 100% happiness guarantee. If for any reason you not love your print, Fracture will make it right. Glass prints also make unique gifts for friends and family we'll never forget. Fracture prints look incredible. You really need to see them to believe it. That's no doubt about that. Upload your photo at FractureMe.com slash to print your photo on glass today. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. When you visit FractureMe.com slash and enter promo code, you get 20% off your order. That's FractureMe.com slash and enter promo code to save 20% off Fracture Glass Print. We thank Fracture so much for sponsoring. They are a very, very good sponsor. Uh, with the ever-changing routines, there's never been a better time to learn something new. Boy, that's for sure, isn't it? With thousands of options available, finding the best way to learn can be challenging. My recommendation is an app called Blinkist, which I'm using while I am plate spinning. Blinkist is unique and powerful. It works on your phone, your tablet, or your web browser. Let me tell you what it is. Blinkist gives you the best key takeaways, the need-to-know information from over 3,000 nonfiction bestsellers in over 27 categories, Blinkist condenses them down into blinks, which you can read or listen to in just 15 minutes. So two of those, my plate spinning's done. And now Blinkist offers its members even more, including exclusive original podcasts from top authors and creative thinkers. You still get access to the entire Blinkist library with the membership. And now you can also dive deeper into full-length nonfiction audiobooks at a special discounted price. Over 14 million people use Blinkist to deepen their knowledge in topics spanning self-improvement, personal growth, management, leadership, and mindfulness, happiness, and more. I love it all. I listen to it all. And I, when you're doing it, time just passes by and you've got everything in there that you remember. You know what I mean? You read a whole book, month later, this is everything you remember. We've got um, The Barefoot Investor by Scott Page. Pape, sorry. Everything is Fucked, a book about hope. Sapiens, Brief History of Humankind, Becoming by Michelle Obama, The Threat by Andrew McCabe, The Future of Capitalism by Paul Collier, and Hacking Darwin by Jamie Metzl, and Outgrowing God by Richard Dawkins. Those are just a few of them. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer uh, just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership and up to 65% off audiobooks, yours to keep forever. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash N-N. slash P-E-N-N. P-E-N-N to get 25 cents off, 25% <laughs> off premium membership and seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash N-N. <laughs> with, with the questioning. So, uh, what else we got? Um, let's do a recap of Fool Us. How was it last week? It was a wonderful episode. Oh, by the way, fuck you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> it's the fuck you, Scott uh, department of the show. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, first of all, we open with Hans Clock. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hans. Yeah. <laughs> I love Hans Clock. Clock. And his beautiful monologue to camera with the wavy hair. Um, if, you, if you're not familiar with Hans Clock... You should be. You should you be should. ashamed of yourself if you're not familiar. Yeah. But do a search for Hans Clock. Hans Clock is Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. Yes, he is. 
The amazing thing is he's not like Gaston, and that's impossible because everyone who looks like Gaston acts exactly like Gaston, except for Hans Klock. Hans Klock is the sweetest, most pleasant man in the world. He is a wonderful guy, and he does magic very quickly. Very, <laughs> very quickly. quickly. Very you know, quickly. Um, if as as uh, as um, as Lorne Michaels once said, if you can't be funny, be fast. <laughs> yeah. It's a ringling thing as well. Yeah, Hans Clock does that. I mean, this is. It started off with like you know. Again, I, I'm pretty ignorant about the world of, of magic until it comes to fool us. And I was aware of Hans Clock's show here in Vegas, and, and her, her described by many. And so when all of a sudden I was working at Foolus and in comes Hans Clock, I was just like, really? And then, <laughs> and also because he's an illusionist, and illusions don't really, you know. No, there's four ways to do them, and we know them. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so. It takes a great deal of bravery to be an illusionist on Foolus. Yeah. And Hans Clock has bravery. <laughs> he does. And I remember turning the producer Lincoln like, Hans Clock? And. He was like, oh, yeah, Hans Clock. <laughs> and, and then I saw rehearsal with his monologue to camera, and I was like, oh, this is fabulous. He's great. <laughs> he's great, and he's completely in on it. There's not a part of him that doesn't understand exactly what you're thinking watching his act. Yes. and Right then, down to the wind machine. Right down to the wind machine and looking directly in the camera and being like, if I lose my concentration, I lose my life. Um, the side note, this set of part, I tried, I basically had memorized the monologue and for all of Fulos from this appearance on, Penn and I kept doing the Hans Clock monologue before we did menial tasks, <laughs> <laughs> which was my favorite runner of any season we've done. <laughs> but he, uh, he came on and does, uh, hey, uh, does Matt, two... do you, uh, I know this isn't your job, but I'm kind of yeah. harried right now. Could you just yeah. grab me a quick cup of coffee? Now look, many magicians have died trying to retrieve cups of coffee for other magicians. <laughs> Some by taking a bullet, others by drowning a water tank. The only person I could let do this task is myself. If I lose my concentration for just one moment, I lose my life. Yes, I'll get you coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Uh, and, you know, he comes out. He does. Uh, he does mag magician's revenge or assistant's revenge in like this uh, tape and uh, rap where he, he he gets himself wrapped up against the pole. His assistant comes and pulls around the curtain. Then all of a sudden, in the same motion, out comes Hans Clock undoing the curtain. His assistant is wrapped up. Now, normally that's reversed, right? And it's this assistant's revenge. And that's why it's called assistant's revenge. Yeah. And it was only to set up because he was going to put himself on top of a giant sword. And so now she gets her revenge and puts him on top of a giant sword. And Fulas does what Fulas does not do best, which is manufactured drama. <laughs> so Hans Clock is concentrating. He's spinning around on the tip of a sword. And all of a sudden, boom, the sword goes through him. And uh, the curtain comes down. And Fulas paid all the rights to get the dive, dive, dive alarm from submarines to play <laughs> as the curtain comes down. It's like bang, bang, bang. <laughs> and then <laughs> I had well, the. And a lot of people thought the fries were done. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're like, they're not really doing this. But lo and behold, Hans Clock is waiting there for us. And then when they raise the curtain, he does the entire interview with Allison with a sword through his sternum. <laughs> He's the greatest, isn't he? He's so good. Yeah. I love Hans. And He's such a sweetheart. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you, like Godot said, you want him to be a dick. Yep. Yeah. And Or you want to say, and he also makes it so good because if he were here in this conversation, the conversation wouldn't change at all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? No, and... And I, I go to do pre-interview, and I'm fully expecting him to be like, I got it. Don't worry. I was expecting him to put him in that category of a, don't worry about it. I know how to do television, buddy. <laughs> he was the sweetest guy. Talked to me all the time and, and basically like gestured a little bit with his hand to interrupt me for just a moment to be like, remember that I will have a sword through me for the interview. <laughs> <laughs> Very politely reminding me that he will have a gigantic sword through him. And I was like, yes, I'm aware that that's primarily what's going to make air. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and also he's right you know like uh as someone who's like a really kind of been a student of magic for the last three years and watching these shows and working on these shows. Um, I've seen the illusion work is, is considered cheesy and yet there's no way to like regularly practice illusions, you know, and they're very hard to build. And then um, you see a lot of people try to, because of the things of hating the cheesiness of it, try to reinvent the wheel. And when you see illusions done without music, when you see illusions done with dialogue, when you see illusions done where you try to actually give it some real context before I like rip a, a lady or out of a box or put a lady into a box and try to give it some kind of real authenticity. And it feels way worse than watching a cheesy guy to music just run people in and out of their illusion. That's breaks. what it's supposed to be. Yeah. It's always been designed. Yeah. And so as much as you want to make fun of Hans clock, he's actually just not only is he great, he's doing it the best way you should do it. Yes. And it's good. <laughs> yeah. It's really good. It's really good. Don't forget yeah. that part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hans also does the opposite of what everyone else does, which is to try to get an illusion to fill 10 minutes because they're so expensive. Hans <laughs> Hans will spend $250,000 on a 3-minute piece and do 17 illusions in that 3 minutes. <laughs> just cuz he is no fear. He's just going at it full speed. This is an illusion. This is what it is. Yeah. So good. And it's even funny for, for fools. He hardly ever talks to camera, but for fools, he'd talk to camera for that monologue, which is great. But you can watch his back foot on the on the wide shot jiggle a little bit because he's just not even used to standing still. Like he didn't want to. No, he runs so fast. <laughs> yeah. He would have liked to have done that monologue in a jog. <laughs> <laughs> Steady cam attached to it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh yeah i still have that monologue in my email i love it i i'm gonna have that handy for the rest of my life <laughs> so good we had a canadian magician named michael barada he came out uh with allison and um now El, had him el nicta barada is what uh during the day the earth stood still the aliens say to us <laughs> oh well, what if there's any what if there's any relative <laughs> or did we accidentally summon them? Klaatu Niktu Barada? Is that what it is? You should uh, know this, Ready Rich. It's close. I think one of the syllables is wrong. Or Bratu, maybe? I'll have to look it up. Uh, go ahead. All right, in that case, Michael Barada, you're safe for now. <laughs> uh, Canadian com comedy guy. Uh, I brought over Allison. He had uh, two uh, marker boards. They drew faces of, of each other. Uh, place it into envelopes and then um, open the envelopes and their face and their portraits at switch places. Exact drawn portraits in front of our faces at switch places. Really fun, um, really fun uh, magic trick. It was just backwards. Platu Barada Nikto. Ah. <laughs> I was like, did I, did, I, I was, did I get my second recap backwards? <laughs> Is there some hand gesture too? Or. <laughs> That's close encounters. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, next up, we had a Norwegian uh, fellow named Hedne. And that this one, I, I could have, if I could have bet you were going to talk about one of your favorite magic principles with this, I, I would have won money on this. Well, Hedne is also uh, my favorite kind of magician because his name is Piglet. <laughs> He's just called Ned over He's here. He's just Ned. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, we're working in the uh, in the edit bay on Headnet. You mean you're working in the bedit on Ned? Ned. <laughs> and who's the football player whose name is Pig Latin? Oh, uh, oh, well, I forgot his name now. John we, Elway. Uh, Elway. That's it. Elway. Elway. And then, of course, my favorite. Uh, my favorite uh, phrase in Big Latin is ant spray. <laughs> Get the ant spray. You mean the sprant? <laughs> sprant is good. Uh, there, here's a quiz for people at home. There is one word. One word. It's actually two words. It becomes one word. That is a word straightforwardly and in Pig Latin. Oh. There's a phrase that's a real phrase. That you can use, and you can also use the uh, the the uh, Pig Latin version of it. I worked a long time on finding one, and I have. 
<laughs> I will leave it to people to come up with it. Do you want to reveal it at the end of the episode or, or you want to leave people hanging? I'll reveal it at the end if I think of it. We often forget. <laughs> Good point. Good point. This is treacherous. Um, he had, uh, by the uh, way, the title of this, uh, of this episode is if we lose our concentration for even a moment, we lose our lives. <laughs> Go ahead. So what did, uh, what did Ned do? Uh, Ned had a bunch of cards. Utway, id day, ed day, uday. <laughs> Wrote numbers on all the backs of the cards. Had uh, a member of the audience pick a card. And I think Allison pick a number. And then he pulled out that number and he went to that card. And then he said, I had a prediction. I think it was 10 of clubs and 33. He revealed it. It was a jack of spades and the three of hearts. And then... After that moment of false disappointment, he flipped the cards that were chosen over and they had the, the accurate card. The numbered card became the jack and the um, chosen card became the numbered card. And as soon as I saw that trick, I was like, oh my gosh. And five minutes, I was like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, this is Penn's favorite principle. This my favorite Penn's principle. Favorite my favorite principle. The question, what actually happened? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not what did he say happened. Not what do we think happened. Now, what do we remember happened? But what the fuck actually happened? And even sometimes when you're working on a trick, if you if you have lay people there, a lot of times asking them to re-describe what the trick was is like super helpful. Um, when you realize there's, a, there's a, sometimes you're missing the story that they're processing. So it's it's good good stuff. Um, Vincenzo Ravina um, was next, and he came out with uh, uh, some 3D glasses and a giant helmet. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And he actually had it where he had put the helmet on Allison, and then Allison chose a symbol and kept it to her chest, one of five symbols. And the entire audience wearing 3D glasses, including you guys, could look up and call out the, the symbol that Allison had selected when she was wearing the magic helmet. Mm -hmm. uh, then phase two, everyone in the audience, uh, or a bunch of people from the audience could draw anything they wanted and put inside the a box. The box was in an audience member's hand. Teller was brought up on stage to wear the helmet. Uh, he selected a random image. Uh, Teller selected one of the random images from the box, looked at Allison, and Allison could see the image that Teller was thinking of, which was a butterfly. Then Allison said, well, I can't say what I was thinking on national television, so I'll just say butterfly, was her words. And that was a very strange thing to say on CW. Very strange. For Allison. Very strange for Allison's image, although she is the one that does talk about masturbating with a flute in a movie. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so from that point on. Uh, but most of the Twitter feedback I got was everyone just wondering what Allison saw that she couldn't say on air. Uh, there is a technique in comedy that is the least successful technique I know. <laughs> Sometimes used... You take a horn and honk instead of a word. <laughs> Very close. Uh, one of my uh, co-workers on the Hollywood Squares would do this. And um, I, don't, I don't think it fooled anyone. <laughs> they would say, ho, ho, you don't want to know what I'm thinking. <laughs> and I would lean over to tell her and say, not a thought in their head. <laughs> <laughs> that might be what Allison was doing. Yeah. By the way, if I say there's something I can't see on television, I have something in my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this show concludes with uh, one of your newer newer tricks and one that you love uh, is multiple outs. Oh, do I love that trick? Yeah. Oh, do I love that trick? Boy, did I have trouble selling that to Teller. That is one crazy ass trick. It is crazy. As a matter of fact, the first time I saw the theater, I was like, I don't know if I get it. I, I, I kept bouncing around perspectives, I think, and seeing it in different ways. I didn't understand the payoff the first time I saw it at all. That's what I want out of a magic trick. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the truth is the television strengthened it. The second time I saw it in the theater, I realized I was an well, idiot. Well, that's not, not no, it no. It was because you're an idiot. You saw yeah. it very early on. And it's a yeah. very complex idea to get across, and my pattern was not getting it across. 
The second yeah. time you saw it, I cleaned it up. And by uh, TV, I'd cleaned it up any more, even more, and then they also helped me. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was really strong on TV. It was a really great uh, trick. But uh, it's 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 a thing that you guys do best that every magician thinks they want to do. And then it just – where it seems like it's a trick on one person and the audience is in on it. But it turns out it's a trick on the audience. Yeah. And that's such a hard arc to write. And that's you such know, a hard thing to really get. We have beauty in our hearts. We want yeah. to please our audience. But if you heard Teller and I talk about it, you might not think that. <laughs> okay, we got him right here, Teller, and then we will fuck the shit out of them. We will just <laughs> fuck them up. They think they're one step ahead of us. Fuck them. <laughs> That's what we're saying about the people that we love and are working for. <laughs> <laughs> we had Rich Summer come out, your, our good friend Rich. I like Rich Summer. Yeah, Rich Summer, uh, he's on a he's on a CW show now. He was on Mad Men forever. Mm -hmm. he's, on a, he's on a bunch of TV shows if you look him up. And he also, uh, very cutely, was a Penn and Teller fan in his youth and yes. sent us fan letters. He was 12 and pictures that he drew of us and uh, all sorts of stuff, which he still has the letters we wrote back to him. I know. That's the thing that, that it seems like a regular celebrity cameo. And what you actually brought out was like a super, you basically did like a, a make a, make a wish. You basically brought a, a kid's dream <laughs> and made them come true. He also, um, sent us invitations to his high school play that he was yeah. in. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and he's become a very good friend and he's, he's very smart and very wonderful. I like him and a good yeah. actor a yeah. and did a, uh, a movie that's great. The movie about the psychics that he wrote yes. and started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the name of that? Can you find that, uh, Rich? I don't Rich, know the name of it Rich all, Summer. Yeah. Uh, the movie that he uh, wrote and uh, produced and starred in. Um, and he, the friend, he, so he had to call a friend. For people, if you don't see the episode, he had to call a random friend, and he called the random friend. The friend he called actually was was a person who went to a Penn and Teller show with him when he was thirteen. So it was a dream come true for that kid as well. What's the name of the show? The Crooked Somebody. Cro the Crooked Somebody. If you haven't seen it, it's easy to find. Watch the Crooked Somebody. It's a great movie. Yeah, and uh, had them think of a random card, and all of a sudden. He turned around to the audience. Only one person was standing. And that person was holding an envelope with their card. Penn and Teller revealed that actually, before he turned the camera around, there was 52 people standing up with 52 different cards. And everyone else just sat down. And then to prove it, they said, go ahead and we'll go over to this person with their envelope. Open it up in the envelope. And it says, oh, this isn't the card I thought I was holding. I was also fooled by Penn and Teller or something like that. Yes. yes? And then everybody opens their envelopes. And 51 yeah. of the cards say, I was fooled by Penn and Teller, and only the selected card was held by the person. Yeah. It's a, so good. It's a nice trick. I like it. It's a nice trick. It's a nice trick. And that's one of the fun things. Like I think about this all the time. If you guys didn't have Foolish, Foolish makes you guys come up with 14 closers a season. Mm -hmm. And you know, even with just the material you had before you came to Vegas, you could rotate an amount of in and out from all of your old shows and constantly have a different show for people. But this show has made you guys have to invent so much. And this, this is a fool. Great... Us has eaten our material like crazy. And that's really good. Yeah. Cause on my other, uh, my little magic podcast, we're going back and watching season one and the, all the early seasons too. And it is crazy. The murderer's row that you guys are closing out season one with <laughs> like every, every trick is like a hall of fame magic trick from your repertoire. That no, sitting here trying to write season eight, I'm like, good Lord, if they knew then. <laughs> <laughs> if they knew then, they would just be burning up their best Broadway stuff right in season one. I don't know if they would have done it the same way, but it was, it's really great. Fool Us season eight, we're going to be shooting in October. And we have yeah. written some crazy good stuff. Yeah. We have, I think, a stage illusion that will uh, fool people. Even Hans Clock? Yeah, I think it will. <laughs> was it inspired by Hans Clock? Of course. <laughs> Nothing we do is not inspired by Hans Clock. Is it the kind of thing that requires a, an incredible amount of concentration on you and Teller? Or we will lose our life. Yeah. <laughs> Ashtray. <laughs> Ashtray. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> Took me oh, a long good. time to think of that. But <laughs> ashtray, you never know whether yeah. someone's speaking pig Latin, <laughs> and it could be used in the same sentence. Yeah. Just take that and put it in the ashtray. <laughs> They mean the ashtray or they mean the trash. I don't know. I don't know what they mean. Because sometimes they speak pig Latin. Oh, that is really rewarding. It is. It is. Maybe maybe the thing I'm proudest of in my life. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the season's been kicking ass, man. It's great. Season seven's been really fantastic. And uh, you, I guess ready already is ready. So I'll just say we got more to talk about on Wednesday. But for right – oh, by the way, I'm still having a blast doing cameos. Oh, yeah. If you go to cameo.com, I'll say anything to you you want personally. And I've had people now sending me in jokes that I don't get that say, <laughs> read this exactly. I want uh -oh. to send it to my friend. So I'm afraid that maybe I am, you know, setting off sleeper cells. I was going to say, Brett Favre got in trouble for uh, getting tricked into saying stuff to like some white supremacists. So just be a little careful on the inside joke thing. Okay. <laughs> but I love doing the cameo.com. You know, birthdays and uh, anniversaries and people that are losing weight that want a pep talk and performance art. Actually, you know what? I just realized that there's a recent picture of, of Brett Favre with Trump golfing. So maybe he knew exactly what he was doing. So I rescind. I rescind my warning. And that was Penn Sunday School. That was Penn Sunday School. Cha cha cha. And to you become oh, naked. And do remember how happy you'll make me if you've got another ashtray trash one for me. Oh man. People can maybe they'll pop up in their lives. When anything ends with A, bells go off in my head. And you know we love you so much. Where did you buy your ashtray? eBay. And, and how did you get him the money? Hey, pal. <laughs> You pay? Apple Pay. Apple Pay, right. Hey, that's good. I used I used Papple on Bay to buy my trash. <laughs>